So I do want to dig on that a little bit more. You know, when you first ask that question that they, they probably would say, well, I don't really need anything. How do you break that boundary and go beyond? Yeah, if someone says, I don't need anything, then that's often not true. This is almost certainly apocryphal. I'm pretty sure he never said it, but like supposedly Henry Ford said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. No one would have said, oh, a motorized vehicle would be just what I need because nobody could think of it, right? They thought they were fine with their horses. He probably didn't say it's too perfect a quote, but it illustrates quite nicely that sometimes people don't know what they need. And so I think the challenge as like a product builder, whether you're in Silicon Valley or whether you're working for a media company is listening to, to what they're saying or what they're not saying or what they don't even realize they're saying. So maybe they may be complaining about this or the other, but they don't necessarily know what the solution is. One of the other things I, I like to generally ask people, because people are, are reticent sometimes to talk too much about things that they love or be too effusive. But I generally find if you ask people what pisses them off, they're quite happy to talk and talk like at length. So if you ask that question, obviously not quite like that, with a bit more tact, they're quite happy to offload. And you can learn a lot that way as well. And make sure you're not doing that. That's a fantastic tip. Has there ever been anyone who refused to be on that list? We didn't have anybody, to our knowledge, who's refused to be on the list. In the early days, we had a lot of so what? Like, uh, hey, you're on the Gen T list. Congratulations. They're like, what? Gen T is Tatler's new platform for young entrepreneurs in Asia. Okay, I know Tatler. Okay, cool. Do I have to do anything? Like, you know, that was the kind of the, the general reaction. And it's been brutally honest because like, that's the way it is when you're building any new brand. You know, you need to build equity in the brand. You need people to care about it. You need to, it takes time to kind of build that status among your audience. And even coming with the kind of Tatler name tag, which, which boosted it to a, a, a significant degree in terms of prestige in the region, it still was a struggle to gain credibility with this specific audience segment of like entrepreneurs and, and a kind of younger generation who had different values and were looking at things differently and maybe sort of talent differently. And that changed over time. It went from us calling people and saying, hey, you're on the Gen T list and I'm going, oh, okay, cool. To people coming up to me and saying, how do we get on the list? And that's my most common, the most common thing people ask me when I'm at a networking event or whatever. It's like, hey, my friend's on the list. How do I get on the list? Or like, how can I nominate myself? And, you know, we have a public nomination form. And when we put that up online a few years ago, we didn't get that many applications. Now we get like hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. We get over a thousand a year. So yeah, we never had anyone who didn't want to be on the list, but certainly we had people initially who were not bothered. And what's been a really satisfying part of the journey is building a brand that people have felt an affinity with and that want to be a part of. They've seen the benefit to their friend who may be on the list and they kind of want to be in the club. As one of our honorees who says to our kids, she calls it like mommy's secret spy club or something. So her kids can relate to it. It's like a secret place that she goes to where she can learn and, and do cool stuff. Amazing. So two questions arising out of that. You mentioned building equity. Were there particular milestones in building Genty that come to mind that you saw the value of it increasing? Uh, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, the Obama Foundation had a leadership summit in KL. They picked like a lot of fellows from across the region to be in their young leaders program. And we saw the website and we're like, wow, this is really cool. And then we started to get suspicious about just how many Gen T honorees were in there. And we're like, this is getting more than a coincidence. This is basically a Gen T list, but with the cool design uh, Obama branding. And okay, so we kind of reached out to them or they reached out to us, I don't know, my, like my team in KL. So I ended up going there and because we had so many JNT honorees flying into KL for the event, like dozens and dozens, I went to KL, I got to attend the summit and then we hosted a couple of dinners for the JNT honorees, a kind of unofficial satellite event just because we had so many honorees from across Asia in one city. It was great. Anyway, the organizers uh, that worked for the foundation told my colleague, like, yeah, off the record, but we did refer to the JNT list quite a bit when we were doing our research. And that for me was like, oh my God, like we've reached a level of credibility and respect. Obviously, I'm not suggesting that they looked at the list and just copied it, but the, the fact that they use that as a barometer of credibility they were like, when they were sifting through all their applicants and for their fellowship program and were figuring out who's for real, who's not, one of the things they looked at was their profile to learn more information about them. And if we had a profile on them that kind of already started, to, they gave them some indication that they'd reached some level of success. That was like, wow, that was a, a big moment for me because this was in the early days as well, at the end of 2019. I was like, wow, we're really starting to make it. 
Just thinking of a recent example was when we launched the Gen T list 2021 last September. It was fantastic because we were able to get 100 people together in a hotel ballroom for dinner, which none of us had done at that point for basically almost two years. And so there was incredible crackling atmosphere in the room. I emceed the event. I felt like I was emceeing a riot. It, honestly, it was just so wild in there. It was like a gala dinner, but most people were stood up between tables because they're like, oh my God, I haven't seen so-and-so in so long. And oh, I've always admired blah, blah, blah. I've wanted to meet them for a long time. You know, there's an incredible energy in there. And so we had a lot of, we had entertainment and so on that night. But that day was the day that Danny Young, who's the co-founder of Prenetics, a digital health company that does Circle DNA, but also Project Screen. His company do the vast majority of COVID tests in Hong Kong. They also do tests for Heathrow Airport and a lot of places in the UK. They're the test provider for like the Premier League in the UK and La Liga and so on. So like one of Hong Kong's kind of heroes of COVID. So it was announced that day that his company was going uh, public like a one point something billion dollar valuation like via a SPAC. And he hadn't slept the night before because he'd been like up all night working the night before. And then from like 6 a.m., he was doing like Bloomberg and CNN and FT and all this stuff. And then he came straight away from a town hall meeting with his staff to come to our event. And that for me was like, we've got to a level where we really are bringing these people together. He had this insane day, this massive like milestone. It was the first like Hong Kong unicorn company to become publicly listed. And, and the founder chose to come to our event that night to celebrate. And I pulled him up on stage and I did a kind of semi impromptu fireside chat. The guy hadn't slept for two days, but he was <laughs> admirably kind of kept it together. I was looking around and looking at the stage, the person next to me, and I was looking at the people in the audience. And I was like, wow, we really have the most successful, coolest entrepreneurs and young leaders in Hong Kong under one roof right now. You know, I was looking at, there's like one of Hong Kong's best known jockeys. It's that right there. And then there's like Eric Nokfar, the founder of Kluke, like another unicorn company. Jack Jang Airwallocks, like they may even be a Decacorn now, a huge company. They were all under one room and that was like, wow, that's the power of Gen T, that we could bring people together. We could celebrate Danny Young's achievement. People kind of felt comfortable and, and felt part of something. So we talked about the list, the community. So we have to discuss how you actually come up with that list. I understand that the entire process is actually nine months and you go through it with your team. Like, Can you give us you know, behind the scenes look of what that is like? Yeah, coming up with a Gen T list is uh, a huge headache, but it's one worth having because it's important. It's how we build our community. And also it's kind of like our pre-vetting for all our content because we write stories from the editorial lens of the people and ideas and businesses shaping the future of Asia for the better. So when we kind of create the list throughout the year, we then write stories on the people and the people on their list and their businesses. So it's kind of like, we're focusing on people who are creating solutions. And you know, we don't write with rose tinted glasses. So we write very objectively, but by nature, we're covering kind of the positive impact that they make. So it's a very, very difficult job, but once it's done, we have just a long list of amazing stories to write for the year. Yeah, it's a massive process and it does take about nine or 10 months. It's a huge headache, to be honest, but it's something that's very, very important to get right because that's how we build our community. So to get the right names is a multifaceted process. So obviously we do our own market research. We ask past honorees to nominate people for the list. And then we also, every year we find a tribe. We call them a tribe. This is our panel of industry leaders who nominate names to the list and help us to vet them. And this is really, really important as well. So they'll nominate people from their industry. And then we have our own nominations, people that are getting a lot of media attention or people that other honorees have nominated or people that we're just, we're familiar with. And then we also ask our tribe members like, hey, you didn't nominate X, even though like he or she is in your industry why not? What do you think of them? And so we kind of really stress test every single nomination with, with this committee uh, of people who have kind of seen it all, done it all. We're talking about pretty big people, like on our tribe this year was Stephen Chen, who's a co-founder of YouTube. These tribes, you have a different tribe for each jurisdiction? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah. So it's anywhere between like 70 to 80 people in total. Wow. So most markets, we have about 10 people on the tribe, 10 or 12 people, a key part of it. But another key part of it is we have a proprietary scoring system. So we have a number of different metrics that we look at and it's a million dollar question, right? How do you measure positive impact? Like it's very, very difficult to do, but we, we certainly, as much as we can, we try to quantify through some in-house metrics, which are 
obviously under lock and key. I can't share with you exactly the secret source, but we do what we can to objectively quantify it and to put kind of numbers against various achievements. But the key criteria for the JNT list is achievement in the last 18 months. So it doesn't matter like how big your, you got your company five years ago, or if it's still at the same level, it doesn't matter if you have a big name and the media is writing about you a lot. We look at an achievement. So have you entered a bunch of new markets with your company? Have you had a huge fundraising round? Have you just launched an innovative new product? All of these things are things that we look at for the list and that we will rate people based on what they've been doing in the last 18 months. So sometimes you'll get back on the list. But a lot of the time, the list is about a 98% churn. It's new names because we're looking at what's happened in the last 18 months. And people who come back on the list are people that just hit like milestone after milestone, basically. Some of it's quite easy to quantify. Like I mentioned before, like I say, Malaysia's youngest parliamentarian. That's something that you can hang your hats on. Like, wow, this person is really leading. And then maybe someone's done like a hundred million dollar, like series B round. And you're like, wow, okay, this company is clearly valued by the market very, very highly. But then there's other people cultural leaders and so on who it's a bit more difficult to quantify people philanthropists people in, in social enterprises these people we ask ourselves like objectively like objectively as we can can we say that their work has made the world a better place last 18 months has their work made the world more sustainable or more beautiful or more generous or more humane in, in some kind of way or more equitable and if their work has contributed to making the world more equitable, more sustainable, whatever it may be, then we'll strongly consider them for the list. I imagine you must have safeguards in place to ensure that you don't fall into the trap that certain lists have, and they will have a nominee on, and there's a recent controversy. There was one person on that list, and it turns out that everything that he was being talked about was all false. How do you ensure that this doesn't happen to you? Because one incident can ruin everything. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think by having the thorough vetting process that I just mentioned is really all you can do to avoid a, a controversy such as that. I'm sure that the list that put the individual that, that you're referring to have very thorough processes as well. But yeah, all I can speak of is, is from my example, which is like, we do our best to not leave any stone unturned. And certainly like our proprietary scoring system is, is helpful, but you're still relying on information that, that they have provided sometimes. And so having that industry insight, having the tribe and having the relation, a strong relationship with the tribe. So not just so that these industry experts, like giving us a name over email, then like, that's it. Maybe they'll come to the launch party. Like we get on the phone with them. We have coffee meetings with them. We go to their office with a long list and a clipboard and like ask for their, for their insights on people that they didn't nominate, people that they didn't nominate. That's incredibly, incredibly useful. And again, from day one with Gen T, that's where being part of the Tatler group really gave us a, a leg up. Because we could like reach out to these big tycoons and established people from day one and say like, hey, do you want to help us with this project? And because we were calling from Tatler, they said, yes, if we were calling from a startup media company, they probably would have said, well, they wouldn't have picked up. So based on the kind of people that you've been having on your list, do you see a trend in terms of the kind of people who are coming on and the kind of things they're doing? Everybody's making the world a better place. Everybody is having a positive social impact on the world, whether it's yeah, making the world more equitable, more sustainable, more beautiful through their works. The, the trends we see on the list are trends that we're seeing across society and across entrepreneurship in Asia. Our sustainability category is growing every year. Our social entrepreneurship category is growing every year. Our finance and VC category is growing every year because there's more and more people in crypto and NFTs. And I'm sure this year is going to be the year of NFT on the Gen T list. So yeah, the trends are generally reflective of that. I think one of the great strengths of the Gen T list is its diversity. Someone in our community, they'll often say like, hey, I'm a fintech entrepreneur, for example, but I know all the fintech entrepreneurs in Hong Kong or Singapore, wherever they're from, but only through Gen T would I be at a dinner sat next to an Olympic gold medalist. And then like next to them is like, you know, a world-renowned artist and next to them is like a Michelin star chef or whatever. Like that diversity is really strong. And then that fintech entrepreneur can also be connected to someone else in their industry in another market they might not otherwise know. So in general, the list is very, very diverse, but certain trends do emerge. The world of social entrepreneurship being one, sustainability being another one. And of course, cryptocurrencies, everything, NFTs, and probably the metaverse, we'll see a couple of honorees on this year's list. You've clearly done a lot. You've built this community. The question I suppose a lot of people will have will be, what's in it for Gen T? Because you are ultimately a business. How do you generate revenue to continue doing what you're doing? 
So like a lot of media companies, we rely on advertising and sponsorship to support what we do. So we work quite closely with partners who want Gen T to put their spin and, and editorial lens and credibility to produce like branded content for them. Or sometimes we'll do co-branded events with the Gen T community. And what we like to do is like win, win, win events. So we'll try and do like small intimate events where the partner is able to really bring something to the table for the honorees. Maybe it's like access to a high quality speaker they have that the honorees want to meet. And at the same time, the sponsor wants to meet them. We always do stuff where it's kind of like win-win for the community and the, the sponsor. So other things that you do, the newsletters you mentioned earlier, there's also the podcast Crazy Smart Asia and you are on it as well. Sometimes, can you tell us a bit about what that experience is like? Because you've interviewed some really, really interesting people as well, like Jimmy Wells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jimmy Wales, I met when he was a guest on a virtual event that we did and, and I asked him to go on our podcast, which he said yes to. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I find it much easier being on your side. <laughs> it is. Like I said, uh, I think off mic, this interview has given me massive imposter syndrome because some of the caliber of some of the other guests you've had on this podcast, I'm like, why am I telling a podcast audience like why I went to school? <laughs> Who cares? So I, I'm feeling very big imposter syndrome right now. Right now. So yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a real, real pleasure so far. So yeah, I, I enjoy being on the other side. Like, and this is what I get out of my out of my job is that I really curious and I love storytelling, of course. And the majority of people on the Gen T list that we do coverage on, they have these incredible incredible stories and crazy smart asia gives us the long form capability to really tell those stories in their own words like there's only so much you can do with even like a 2000 word article like but to spend like 45 minutes talking to somebody and hear the intonation in their voice what gets them riled up what gets them morose like that's really really exciting and so far kevin kwan hasn't sued us for for using the the crazy asian bit which is good I mean, like, I saw quite a few of the interviews that you've done before. You clearly love it. You're very natural at it. What is your process in preparing for these kind of interviews? I think no different from yours. I've listened to a lot of your interviews and you. a lot of your interviewees have said like, your research is so good. <laughs> and I have to say, I the exact same opinion. I don't know if you've been calling my mom or what, but like you seem to know a lot about me, which is um, really impressive. So I don't think it's really any different in that we'll do some research on the guests. We'll often do a pre-interview just to kind of break the ice and get a sense of like what they're excited about, what they're interested in talking about. I'll maybe test the water then if there's something like uncomfortable potentially for them to talk about. I'll see if they're willing to do it because they'll say yes and that's great. And if they say no, then you get rid of the frostiness on the pre-call rather than, <laughs> rather than the recorded interview. And yeah, and otherwise just kind of record a longer podcast and then edit out the boring questions. But that's what I love most about my job is I get to meet some of the, just the coolest, most influential leaders in all different kinds of fields. Back when we could travel every year when we launched the list, I get to fly around the region and go to the launch parties in each of our eight markets across Asia. It's like entering a cheat code in a video game, right? Because I'd like kind of fly into a city, like I fly into KL, for example, like dump stuff in a hotel room, get changed, go downstairs usually to the ballroom of the same hotel. And then there's like 50 of the most inspirational, amazing leaders and entrepreneurs in that country. And they're all under one roof. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, go from one to the other to the other. And so for me, someone who's very kind of curious and just gets really, really excited in, in telling people stories and hearing about the things people have gone through and what they've overcome and what they've been able to achieve, that's what gets me excited every day by coming into work. Is there a particular person that comes to mind right now that has really excited you recently? The last episode of Crazy Smart Asia, we interviewed uh, Nadine Lustre, who's a big pop star and, and an actor in the Philippines, like huge, 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 10 million plus Instagram followers or something. And she's been quite candid in the past talking about mental health. And, and in the pre-interview, I was like, we talked about this in the past. And then she kind of mentioned like suicidal thoughts and so on. And, you know, I was like, are you willing to discuss this? And obviously, it's very personal to you. She said that she was. She was willing to discuss her, her brother's suicide and so on. So I went into the interview, obviously, with the utmost tact. And we had a conversation. And she was so incredibly brave and honest. And she revealed quite a bit about her struggles with depression and a suicide attempt that she, she'd made that she'd never revealed before. I, I didn't know the conversation would go there at all. And I was just kind of bowled over by her bravery and how she's this big pop star actor that could just be like raking in the sponsorship deals, product based on her Instagram, et cetera. But like, she doesn't have to talk about that stuff, but she's using her platform because she wants to raise awareness of suicide and depression and destigmatize it 
And uh, that's a microcosm of everyone that's on the Gen T list. And we think of pop stars as maybe not sometimes the, the deepest of people or whatever, but like everyone on the Gen T list, we identify them for a reason. And she kind of really showed that in that episode. And that she had this courage and tenacity to talk about a really difficult topic. Um, so that was something that genuinely bowled me over that, that we did recently. Like I said, that was the last episode of the most recent season of our podcast. And for me, that hits home because I used to be a Samaritan volunteer back when I lived in the UK, which is a kind of suicide prevention line, which is difficult for me because it's listening and usually I'm a big talker. <laughs> but joking aside, it, I did it because it's really important because suicide kills like more people under 40 than anything, or, or maybe a second after car crashes, but it's a huge silent killer. And it's really, really important. And Nadine just kind of stood up and was like, I'm going to use my platform to kind of spread this message. So that was a recent example. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, we've talked a lot about what you've done before, but what's coming for in the future? Do you have any plans for the future? Does Gen Z have any plans for the future? What can we expect? So yeah, plans for the future a lot. We are hoping eventually to be able to deliver on that promise of a summit um, this year, <laughs> should COVID restrictions allow. But I think one of the most exciting new projects we have, we're not a continuation of, of things. We're looking forward to the Gen T list this year. There'll be a new season of our podcast and, and so on. One of the most exciting new products that we're launching is called Gen T Disrupt, which is an online learning course. So basically like a masterclass style videos but aimed at millennial and Gen Z young professionals in Asia who are looking to upskill and, and give their career a boost. We have partnered up with Sofa Soda, which is a, a startup in this space run by Tim Yu, who's a Gen T honoree and, and good friend of, of Gen T's. He's created this platform. We've partnered with him. We're creating 10 courses with Gen T honorees as the talent to kind of teach people everything from like NFTs to like emotional intelligence, public speaking, entrepreneurship and leadership to help them upskill and disrupt, basically. That's why it's called Gen T Disrupt. So that's really, really exciting because a lot of what we do is, we do put out a lot of content to a wider audience, but also a lot of what we do and the value we bring is to the people in that community, the Gen T honorees. So this product is truly like B2C. It's out there with the mission of helping our wider audience to kind of like, uh, yeah, upskill and, and improve themselves. So that's super, super exciting. We're doing five in Taiwan with a Gen T honorees from our Taiwan list, which will be in Mandarin. That's launching next month. And then uh, starting this summer, we're doing five with our Hong Kong honorees. The super, super exciting Tim Yu is one of our good friends, very inspiring entrepreneur. He's a founder of Snap Ask, which a lot of people will be familiar with. It's like Uber for tutors. You take a picture of your homework and get connected with a tutor. So he's built one really impressive business already that's doing incredibly well. And he's launching now a second one. And I'm sure it's going to reach equally stratospheric heights as well. So for me, that's been, been one of the most fun things the last couple of months, because as I said a couple of times, I love building media products. And this for me is totally new space. Like I know nothing about online video courses. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so to work with a partner with expertise in the space, but to bring the Gen T brand, Gen T editorial voice, and of course people from our community and working with them to kind of put something out into the market that we're really proud of has been another cool process. And even though you've talked about imposter syndrome before, I'm sure there are lots of people listening who really admire what you've done and want to follow in your footsteps. What advice do you have for these people? Don't beat yourself up too much. I had a pretty slow start in my career. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I felt like definitely in my mid to late 20s, I had to play a little bit of catch up because I was kind of treading water, worried about making a wrong move and, and almost like paralyzed in living too many different directions that I could take. And, and so I didn't kind of didn't take any of them. And then I realized that I was, I was being so hard on myself. Like, Lee, if you haven't done this, that, and the other, by the time you're 24, your career's over. And that's very much not the case. I'm now realizing at the grand old age of 36, life's a long game. So just kind of be easy on yourself, be kind to yourself, just take it one step at a time. Just make sure you're focusing on improving yourself, always being in receiving mode, try and learn and soak up as much as you can. Do jobs that challenge your, yourself, do jobs that you find rewarding. And you know, if you go into it with the, the right mentality, then things will come. So do you feel like at this point you have found your why? I think I'm closer to finding it. I think I've discovered in the last decade a lot of whys. I don't think people have one why. At least I don't. There's a lot of things that make me excited to do what I do and to get out of bed in the morning. And they include... Coming up, building media products that audiences love. Also mentoring and training other people in the industry where I'm able to. Like there's a lot of satisfaction in that, in like helping people in the early stages of their career. I think 
there's a few different whys. There's a few different things that make me excited to be doing what I'm doing. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to find some others in my career because I'm very much an unfinished piece of work myself. And I think over time, I'll discover even more. And that's exciting. Like if you feel like you've just found all your whys, then what's there left to kind of reach for? I found a couple of them and what's this space, I suppose. And throwing in a wild card here, what is one thing that you feel you should be doing, but you aren't and why? Despite what I just said, I think I should probably be less hard on myself even than I am because everybody has a proclivity to, to be a bit hard on themselves and to compare themselves to others and to kind of wish they were doing certain things or wish they'd done things a little bit better. And so I think I should be better at that. Although I think as we've touched upon before, everything begins with empathy, right? But I think I can always, you can always be more empathetic. You can always listen more. So I think there's a lot of things that I feel like I'm still learning how to do and, and I want to get better at them. And what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? I think as relating to what I just said, I'd like there to be a lot of younger journalists who would be like, yeah, I learned a lot from that guy. To be remembered as someone with humility, because I think without humility, there's no growth, right? Like everything starts in humility if, if you don't have that. And humility doesn't mean a lack of decisiveness. It doesn't mean a lack of leadership. It means listening to people. It means not thinking you have all the answers. So I guess to be remembered as somebody who brought people together, who helped people be their very best selves at work and led with humility and, and represented them. What do you think are the most important qualities of a successful person? Yeah, humility. Because obviously at Gen T, one of my favorite things is I get to meet all these people that have much better answers than I do to this question. Usually what they'll say is certainly humility for sure, but a lot of them will say a persistence and having kind of, and, and it's a cliche, but learning how to fail and learning from it and, and getting back up when you do. I mean, like all cliches, it's a cliche because it's true, right? So certainly what I've learned from the honorees and the entrepreneurs in that community is the value of persistence. Persistence and consistency. You can't just like be your best self a few weeks out of the year. You've got to be your best self every week. You can't just be hustling a couple of days a week. You've got to be hustling every single day. And just having that tenacity and just getting back up when you do get knocked down, like dusting yourself off and just keep walking. Showing up is, is half the battle. So just having that tenacity and, and not being afraid to fail and then just leading with humility. There's too many people in the world that are like bosses, not leaders. And I think that admitting you don't have all the answers is the first step to doing something genuinely innovative. If you think that you have all the answers, you're never going to truly innovate. You're just going to iterate. And where can people go to connect with you, find out more about what you're doing as a Genty? If you want to find me, you can find me on all the various channels, LinkedIn, Instagram, for people who are misguided enough to want to be me in a few years then uh, you can connect with me and I'd be happy to, to answer any questions and Generation T you can find us at Generation T underscore Asia on Instagram or listen to our podcast Crazy Smart Asia available wherever you get podcasts and for general information or to read our stuff Generation T dot Asia and I put all those links in the show notes before I run it up you actually mentioned that you had stopped drinking four years ago what's the story behind that hmm yeah, I did. So I, I did dry January in 2018, and I'm still doing it technically. It's the longest, driest January on record. It was one of those things. I'd just moved to Hong Kong, and my wife and my son, who was like 18 months at the time, hadn't yet joined me. And so I was like, well, I guess meet some friends and kind of go to pubs or whatever, like as, as I would do in Beijing, who I probably won't see that much when, when my family get here. Or I can, you know, run a bit more because I, I like running and kind of try and get into a bit more shape. Because in Beijing, I love my job, as I mentioned, and it was to prophesize about how great the city was, but it was also to know the city's like F&B scene. And so a lot of my professional network, and my personal network were kind of the same. And there was always uh, a new bar opening or there was always a new restaurant that had a new menu. So I put on an awful lot of weight. I was like uh, 108 kgs, pretty big. If you look back at pictures of me, it looks like I've been like stung by a bee or something. It looks like one of those like face apps where like you can kind of change somebody. <laughs> so I was looking to lose some weight. So this is what instigated it. But all of a sudden, like after a month, I just felt I had more time. I wasn't like going out later. So I was getting up earlier. Uh, and then I had more energy for that obvious reason. I don't know. I just had more clarity, more focus, kind of better moods. I had less fat and more money, which is the right ratio of everything. And I, I generally, and I know that everything has come back to empathy today, but I felt like I had more empathy. I feel like a lot of the time in conversations, people are waiting for their chance. They're not listening. They're waiting for their to speak. That it really accentuated when 
people are drinking, I had a couple of drinks, they don't want to do this thing, they're waiting for their chance to blah, blah, blah. So for me, yeah, it wasn't an addiction issue or anything. But when I did it for a month, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I feel really good. I was like, let me see if I can do it for three months. And I did. And I was like, let me see as a personal wellness challenge. Can I do a year without drinking? That would be quite the achievement. And then I did. And then by the end of the year, like my brain had rewired. It's like, like, I was like, I guess I'm going to start drinking again now. And I was like, mm, why? Which is like, as a British male in his early 30s was a very strange realization. So yeah, so I, I still kind of reap the benefits in terms of like more focus at work and generally better sleep and so on. And have more time for my son and everything. Is there anything else you'd like to share that we haven't covered so far? I think, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And I've shared more in the last hour and a half or so than I have with anyone for a long time and I've really enjoyed it so I don't think I I have anything else to give but yeah I want to say thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast I think it's fantastic I love what you're doing and it's been a real real treat like a real honor to be invited so thank you so much